Yeah, just leave it. Okay. All right, as I was saying, we're just going to do a few minutes of silent meditation to help the mind settle. So please, um, sitting comfortably, eyes closed. Uh, and then just bring your awareness to the breath. and breathing in a very nice, comfortable, relaxed way through the nostrils. Just settle into that breathing process and um, allow the mind to relax. Anything that comes up in your experience, the thoughts, feelings, external sounds, just let them go. Don't engage too much. Don't make a story. Just sit with whatever's going on and enjoy the opportunity to, to do nothing for a few minutes except be quiet and be still.
Okay, so we can stop there. Uh, I I might struggle with the air, the sound of the air conditioning. Yeah, can we turn it off? Sure. It won't be that long. Maybe stay cool enough. Um, Yeah, so I, I need to know that you can hear me. I, I don't know how much I need to project my voice um, all the way down the back. But, um, okay, so the uh, talk that I wanted to give tonight, or that I've been asked to give tonight, um, practicing Dharma in everyday life. Uh, very important because if we're not able to translate our spiritual practice into our daily activities, then there's a danger of it just becoming something too uh, remote from, from our uh, ordinary life and therefore, in a sense, uh, become something somewhat impractical, uh, maybe just nothing more than an uh, intellectual um, pursuit like that. So, I think the first point to make here is to uh, ask the question rhetorically and then answer it, um, what does it mean to practice Dharma? Or if you like, what is Dharma? Like that. And of course, when we come to Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings, I often think of it as being, I, I mean, it's a religion. We have to say that it's a Buddhist, Buddhism is a religion. There's no question about that. Uh, but we can also say that Buddhism is a very profound philosophy. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, certainly as far as my own interpretation and my own way of relating to it, um, I think of it as a very profound psychological method by which we can understand and transform our mind in a positive way, so as to bring about the very thing that we're all looking for, happiness, okay, like that. And so the question of what is Dharma, taking those things into account, we come into a, into a meditation center like this and we have pictures of the Buddhas and, uh, and various holy saints and statues and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of ritualistic, uh, um, what to say, practices within the Buddhist tradition, pujas and so on and so forth. Um, but if we really look deeply into the teachings of the Buddha, what we can understand, or what I hope we can understand, is that um, Dharma practice means, and this is in fact how it's defined uh, in one of my one of the most influential books in my life and in my practice, a book called uh, Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand, uh, a very extensive commentary on, um, on uh, the, what we call the Lam Rim, the Graduated Path to Enlightenment. There, the author of, the, of that book describes or, or um, defines the practice of Dharma as identifying delusions within one's own mind stream and applying the antidotes, okay? I think that's a very, very important point. I'll say it again. Identifying delusions within one's own mind stream and applying the antidotes. And if we're doing that, we're a Dharma practitioner. If we're not doing that, it doesn't matter whether we're, you know, a famous Buddhist teacher, a monk or a nun, or sitting on a high throne or... Uh, you know, engaging in pujas and prayers and all sorts of religious rites and rituals, if we're not doing that, if we're not looking at our mind, understanding what's going on in our mind, and making an effort to uh, develop our mind in a positive way, then according to that definition, and I think it's a very appropriate uh, uh, explanation, then we're not practicing Dharma, okay? Everything else is a little bit like... Uh, almost like theater, like that. And I think myself that all of these other aspects of the Buddhist religion, the Buddhist tradition, they are very, very important. I don't mean in any way to denigrate them or to, to insinuate that they have no value. 
extremely important, uh, you know, the beautiful statues, the altar, the offerings that we make, and so on and so forth. They're all very significant. They have a very important part to play in our spiritual practice. But the key point, okay, and we must always remember this, looking at our mind, working with our mind, identifying these things that we call delusions, and, again, for the third or fourth time, applying the antidotes. So <clears throat> let's break that down a little bit. What does it mean to identify the delusions? Well, we have to ask ourselves, then ask, what are the delusions that we're trying to identify? Okay, What are these things that uh, generally are perceived to be an impediment to our uh, psychological health, to our spiritual <coughs> development, and indeed our happiness itself? Like them. So generally delusions <coughs> in Buddhism are defined as mental states or uh, mental factors or if you like emotions, states of mind, um, that when they arise, they cause the mind to become um, unpeaceful. They have the effect of disturbing our mind. And that's why they are sometimes referred to as disturbing emotions like that, delusions sometimes also called afflictive emotions like that. What are they? Principal ones are greed and detachment, anger and aggression, pride, jealousy, um, selfishness, okay? Uh, underlying all of these, of course, what we call ignorance. So these are unwholesome states of mind. These are considered to be... Um, these are the things that we need to recognize within ourselves and work with, okay? That's what a delusion is, something which causes us to think and, uh, um, yeah, uh, something that causes us to act, let's say, with our, our speech and with our body um, in a way that is detrimental to our own welfare and in a way that causes us to give harm to other living beings as well, okay? And I think we can understand this quite easily, you know, if we, under the influence of anger, for example, anger, it arises in the mind, under the influence of that negative emotion, that uh, harmful emotion, we say and do things that give harm to other living beings. We look around in the world today, all the fighting, all of the aggression, all of the um, acts of violence and uh, hurt that take place. Whether we're talking about, uh, you know, in interpersonal relationships, whether we're talking about colleagues at work, whether we're talking about society at large or nations going to war. If we look what's behind all of that, we will find its delusion. In particular, uh, not only, but in particular, the mind of anger, okay? It's extremely harmful, extremely um, negative emotion. Uh, all you need to do to, you can prove it to yourself, and of course this is the great beauty of the Buddhist teachings. We can always look closely and into our own experience and identify the truth of, uh, of the Buddhist teachings. So if you take a little time to think about the last time you got angry, um, at somebody or at something for some reason, okay? How does it make you feel? It's not a pleasant uh, emotion. It doesn't make us feel calm and peaceful and happy and open and mentally spacious. Like that. Actually, it has the effect of closing us down and uh, as it brings with it tension and uh, anxiety and frustration and depression. That's where all of these... Uh, uh, problems that we so often encounter in our lives, that's where it comes from, very much. Anger and indeed other, other afflictive emotions as well. So I don't think it's very difficult to identify um, uh, the fact that a negative emotion is detrimental, detrimental to us, 
detrimental to others as well. Okay, and uh, in the world at large, you know, I, I sort of mentioned anger and attachment and pride and jealousy and selfishness and uh, ignorance and so forth. I think, generally speaking, in the world at large, probably for most of us, um, the main problems we have usually either anger or attachment like that. I'm not saying, of course, we are all subject to uh, all of the uh, afflictive emotions. We're not enlightened beings. By definition, being ordinary, we have jealousy, we have pride, we have selfishness and so forth. But probably for most of us, it's, it seems to be one or the other, attachment or anger, and perhaps even both, seem to be most dominant in our life and seem to be the biggest troublemakers in that sense, if I put it in those terms. And of course, there's a relationship between the two, and it's really important to identify that relationship as well. So anger is a um, very, very destructive emotion. Uh, as I said, all of the harms of the world, all of the fighting, all of the conflict that we see around us, it really does come from the mind of anger. Um, we then need to ask ourselves, well, if that's true, is that something that I uh, suffer from? Okay, And one thing about Buddhism that is also really important to recognize and appreciate is that um, we need a lot of courage Okay, if we're going to be Dharma practitioners. We need to be able to look honestly and um, realistically at what's going on in our mind. And it's not always comfortable to do that. We don't like to think of ourselves as being an angry person or an arrogant person or a proud person or a selfish person. And it's not that those qualities define us as uh, living beings, but we are subject to them at different times in different circumstances, okay? But we need the honesty to, uh, and the courage in a sense, to acknowledge that we are sometimes subject to those difficult and harmful emotions. And then we can begin to uh, identify the, uh, how it impacts on us, and then we can begin to work with them a little bit as well. So, uh, yeah, I think to be a true Dharma practitioner, we need to be very honest and very courageous. It's not easy. We all like to present a, a nice facade, a nice persona to the world um, in order to gain approval or recognition or whatever it is we feel we need to gain from other people and the outside world. And we have a tendency to hide um, what, what may be our faults. But if we're going to embark on a path of meditation and internal reflection and uh, and spiritual transformation we we have to sort of move beyond that and we can't uh, pretend anymore we have to look at who we are and the way our mind works and the way our delusions um, uh, cause us to interact sometimes inappropriately with the world and with other people and as i say recognize that's something that i need to work with that's something that i need to uh, overcome if I can, at least initially to pacify and then to work with it and overcome like that. So um, anger is uh, yeah, very destructive, very harmful. And the antidote to anger, there is an antidote, okay? It's, a, it's really important to, perhaps I should also say that um, so much emphasis on delusions in Buddhism. If we're new, if we haven't really sort of, if we don't understand it well and if we don't think about it carefully, it can sometimes feel like, and indeed when we start to look through the practice of meditation into our mind, it can sometimes feel as if we are only delusion, okay? But that's not the case. It's really important to remember that our fundamental nature is something very pure, something very clear. We have what I'm sure you've all heard before is what's called Buddha nature. Okay, We have this potential to be perfect, to be Buddha, like the historical Buddha and like all of the Buddhas 
uh, in the last 2,000 years, like the enlightened beings existing in the world today. That's the potential that we all have, okay? And so in a way, I've always found it helpful to think of our basic nature as something very good, something very positive like that. The delusions, they come and they go, okay? It's not who we are. It's just they are states of mind that manifest at different times, under different circumstances, but then they pass away. So we don't want to over-identify with those uh, harmful states of mind, and, and we shouldn't allow them to, I'd, um, what to say, uh, uh, define who we are. Otherwise, we get too caught up in it. So we need also to be, as well as being honest and courageous, we also need to be a little bit relaxed as well. And it's like, okay, you know, I, sometimes I get angry. It's like, it doesn't make me a bad person. It just makes me a normal person, right? Because we all get angry at different times, or we all have the potential to get angry under certain circumstances. But that doesn't make you a bad person. That just means that, oh, okay, I have to find some method to deal with the anger or to protect myself from the anger, okay? And of course, once anger manifests, then we have to be super careful because at that point, our actions of speech and our physical actions may well be sort of defined by uh, the mind of anger. So sometimes we have to be very skillful. We find that anger is starting to manifest. We just sort of step back a little bit and remind ourselves, be careful. Okay, I'm getting irritated, I'm getting angry, don't speak, don't act just now, okay? Chill out if you like, be cool, because if I say something, I may regret it later. If I do something, I may come to regret it later, like that. Uh, anger, once manifest, we have to be very, very careful and maybe even sort of step away from whatever situation is provoking the anger, maybe even just sort of go for a walk, separate ourselves as much as possible until our mind calms down and we can come back and look at the situation with a little bit more clarity, a little bit more uh, sort of objectivity like that. So what we really want to do is sort of go back a step and look at a way in which we can protect our mind from anger arising like that. And then what we find in the, in the teachings of the Buddha, the main practice for doing that is the practice of patience, okay? Patience by definition is a mind that remains calm and peaceful in the face of difficult circumstances, okay? If you think about it, what provokes anger, okay? Or irritation, anger, like that. Something or somebody, so somebody says something or does something that we don't like, or some external situation uh, arises that irritates us that we don't like, okay? So it's, there's this sense of, um, you know, our I and our ego being very, very heavily involved in the process, okay? It's very much I self-orientated. I don't like what you just said. I don't like what you just did. I don't like being stuck in a, in a traffic jam on a hot night, okay? Uh, I'm late for whatever it is that I'm trying to achieve. So it's like the anger starts to come because we're in a difficult situation and we don't like it. So it's like in some ways the solution is surprisingly easy. Uh, it does require practice. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, always solve the problem. But this simple practice of what we call patience, okay? Just being calm, being peaceful, and not allowing the mind to get irritated and angry, okay? Sort of stepping back a little bit and said, okay, I'm in a situation that I have no control over. Getting upset about it isn't going to help. Or somebody has said something or done something that I don't like. Well, what's going on in their mind that causes them to react in that way or to speak in that way or to act in that way. Perhaps they themselves are in a situation of great distress, great unhappiness. 
And indeed, if we uh, look at psychology, at Buddhist psychology, or just, <coughs> excuse me, the psychology of human beings, generally speaking, people who are acting in a hostile way towards us, we can look at that situation and, and, and say with some degree of certainty, there is a disturbed sentient being, there is a disturbed person, there is an unhappy person, there is a person who is in pain, if you like, psychological pain, okay? If they weren't, then they wouldn't be saying or doing something harmful towards us, okay? So it's like we sort of try and look at it from another point of view. Instead of being very, very reactive and somebody does something, the slightest thing that we dislike and boom, we get angry at them or we get upset with them, try and look at it from another point of view and think, wait a minute, why are they doing that? What's the problem? Why are they so unhappy? And in that way, if we've got space in our mind, if we've got um, you know, a little bit of wisdom, if we're actively working with our anger and our emotions, maybe our response, instead of getting angry at somebody, or uh, you know, maybe we can be a little bit more uh, empathetic and maybe even develop some sense of compassion and say, oh yeah, this person must be really unhappy. I, because we don't know what's going on in their life, you know. Maybe they've just suffered themselves some incredibly uh, deeply painful trauma and they're having difficulty processing it and they find themselves, you know, in a difficult situation and their unhappiness comes out in the form of anger directed at us. If we take it too personally, of course, we will respond and maybe create a difficult situation. But if we can just step back a little bit and don't be so reactive and just think, oh, okay, maybe this person is in pain, you know, what can I do to help this person, if there's anything I can do, but at least don't react with aggression back towards them. Don't take it so personally that we allow ourselves to get upset. That is, keep one's own mind calm and peaceful in the face of that difficult situation. We, not, we may not be able to change the situation, and very often we can't, but we can always change the way we re relate to a situation, okay? And the way we react to situations. And in changing the way we react to situations, we change our experience of a situation. So even, you know, I gave the example of maybe being stuck in a traffic jam, okay? It can be incredibly frustrating. Of course it can. But, you know, we can also think like this. Well, okay, I'm a Dharma practitioner and I'm trying to uh, overcome my anger. And without a difficult situation to give me an opportunity to practice, how can I develop on the path like that? So a difficult situation can then become an opportunity to learn and grow. So instead of getting upset, uh, in the face of a situation like that, we can take it as an opportunity to practice the path, to practice the teachings. We may even think of somebody, you know, in the situation, somebody who's pushing our buttons in some way. It can be very effective to think, oh, this is like my spiritual teacher giving me an opportunity to practice patience like that. Because if we don't practice patience, we can't progress very far on the path. Because every time we encounter a difficult situation, our mind will become disturbed, unhappy, distracted, agitated, like that. And that's how we end up in a, in a situation of endless agitation and stress, and when it gets serious enough, depression as well, like that. So it's like, you know, there are tools for dealing with our afflictive emotions. And uh, if we apply them uh, well, and if we apply them skillfully, every, every situation, every difficult situation becomes an opportunity to turn things around and grow on the path. And this is what it means really to practice Dharma in everyday life, to take the circumstances of life and instead of trying to push away the unpleasant things, okay, and uh, run away from or block out or avoid difficult circumstances to embrace them and to 
turn them into our spiritual practice. Because no matter how hard we try, we'll never really be able to avoid difficult circumstances. To be born into this world is to encounter problems, one problem after another. Okay, the first noble truth that the Buddha spoke about, from the moment we're born till the moment we pass away, you know. Every day, countless difficulties that we have to encounter like that. And it's really frustrating. It can be overwhelming. And it will be overwhelming if we don't find some skillful method to deal with it and to transform it. Because after a while, it just becomes unbearable and so difficult and so complicated. So we have to really embrace these difficult circumstances and the challenges of life and use them to grow strong, uh, you know, to, to develop and to develop not just in a, in a, in a sort of like a, what to say, sort of a, a spiritual sense, but psychologically and uh, emotionally, you know, to, uh, to develop compassion, to develop empathy for the difficulties that other people are having, and so on and so forth. So I, I find this, um, the teachings on anger particularly helpful because, as I say, life is so problematic and there are so many difficulties and we un it's easy to understand how anger is detrimental. And if you think about the practice of patience, uh, sometimes it's not easy, but um, really, what's the alternative? Are we going to allow ourselves to become agitated every time the slightest thing goes wrong? You know, the electricity goes off or the air conditioning doesn't work or there's a mosquito buzzing around uh, in our bedroom at night and we can't get a good night's sleep. If we allow these things to irritate us, then we'll never have any peace or happiness in our mind like that. And uh, as I think the great Saint Shanti Deva says in one of his texts, uh, the great text, um, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, problems are everywhere. It's like, uh, it's as if the, the ground, you know, the, the earth is covered with thorns and glass and uh, broken glass and sharp rocks. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't cover the world uh, in some sort of protective layer of leather or a carpet or something soft so that everywhere we walk in bare feet, it feels nice and comfortable. It's totally impractical and totally impossible. But if we put on a comfortable pair of shoes, strong pair of shoes, wherever we walk, where our feet are protected so we don't experience pain from walking around. And the practice of patience is just like that, okay? If we make a determined effort to stay calm and peaceful, and not react with aggression or anger or even irritation, ideally with kindness and compassion, every time we're confronted with a difficult circuit situation, then life will be so much more relaxed, so much more enjoyable, so much more manageable like that. <clears throat> it doesn't solve the problems. The problems still come. But our reaction to them, our response to them, our experience of them, completely different, okay? And that's why we say, change your mind, change your world, like that. And uh, as I'm sure you know, if you've read anything about Buddhism or taken teachings before, this is the whole point, okay? We create the world, in a sense, through the power of our mind. It's up to us. Do we have a happy experience of life? Do we have an unhappy experience of life? Completely up to us, and it depends on recognizing what's going on internally and making some sort of adjustment. And in, this, in the case of anger, if we don't uh, recognize anger as a detrimental uh, mental affliction, then of course we won't be motivated to do anything about it. And some people think anger is a, is a useful emotion, a, a health, healthy state of mind even to cultivate under certain circumstances. Not according to Buddhism. Why? Because it disturbs our mind and, as I've said, causes us to act in disturbing ways to others as well. So even acknowledging and recognizing anger within our own mind stream, again, comes back to this idea of having courage and being willing to say, okay, I'm not a perfect human being. I have flaws, but I can do something about it like that. And we benefit, and everybody around us benefits if we make that effort. 
So perhaps that's enough to talk about anger itself. The other, the other disturbing emotion, and because this is a, also a very, very big one in our life, this thing called attachment, okay? Attachment is a mind that holds on to something that we perceive to be desirable or enjoyable or meaningful or valuable or precious in some way. And it holds on to these things. It can be a, it can be a physical object. It can be a person. It can be an experience. It can be a place. It can be just about anything at all that gives rise to a sense of pleasure and enjoyment and satisfaction. And we grasp onto these things and we don't want to let them go. Okay. And uh, again, as Buddha taught, it's, it's, it's an impractical and unrealistic way of relating to the world because the very nature of the world is in change, transformation, moment by moment, even on a molecular level, if we, if we think about it, okay? If we think about the, the universe and everything in it, including ourselves, composed of atoms and molecules, particles of energy, constantly in a process of change. I mean, that's not how we see the world, but that is, in fact, what is going on on a, on a much deeper level of, of reality, okay? We see the world in very concretized, solid and uh, graspable forms, okay? And that's what happens. Something is desirable. Somebody is, uh, we like somebody or we like something. We grasp it and hold on to it. But as Buddha said, the inevitable consequence of uh, meeting is separation. And we can look at that in terms of meeting other people or meeting circumstances, okay? So, you know, whether it's being with somebody that we love and care for, our friends, our family, our spouse, our children, our relatives, whoever, sooner or later, we have to be separated from them. It's just a fact of life, okay? And it also equally applies to things, possessions, and experiences. Whatever we've got, you know, our new car, our new house, our wealth, okay, all of these things of necessity, we must be separated from them, if not during the course of our life, then at the time of death, okay? So there is no permanence in our engagement with other people or the circumstances of life. Nothing stays the same. Everything is changing moment by moment. So whoever we have in our life, whatever we have in our life, one day, sooner or later, we're going to have to be parted from them. Okay, That's not a problem from the Buddha's point of view. That's just a fact of life. It's a reality that we really need to become aware of in order to develop the wisdom of non-attachment and in order to develop the ability to let go, okay? Why is that so important? Because if we don't let go, if we are strongly attached to people, places, things, experiences, okay, when the inevitable separation occurs, we experience tremendous pain, okay? The pain of separation, what we can call separation anxiety. And of course, we know this from our own experience. When somebody we love dies, how much pain do we feel? Okay. Um, when things that we consider to be very precious, I mean, maybe we've just bought a new iPhone or a new computer. How do we feel if we lose it or if somebody steals it? Okay. It causes a tremendous amount of mental anguish. And again, Having the wisdom that understands what we call impermanence, that everything changes, that we will never be able to hold on to anything for very, very long, sooner or later, have to let it go, okay? Having that understanding, developing that wisdom, doesn't mean that the problems go away, okay? If somebody steals our new iPhone or if we lose our computer, we've still got a problem, okay? We've got a Go and buy a new one. We've got to earn the money to buy a new one. Okay. When someone we love passes away, okay, there is still great sorrow associated with that. We've lost somebody very, very precious. The problems don't go away. But if we can lessen our attachment to these things, then the pain that we feel when the loss occurs 
is that much less, okay? Because it's also a fact that wherever there is attachment, there will inevitably be pain and suffering when the separation takes place. And the separation will take place, okay? Like I say, if it's only, even if it's only at the time of death, because you think about it, when we die, we can't take anything with us. We can't take anyone else with us. Even if we're the richest person in the world, what difference does it make? You know, between the richest person in the world, the poorest person in the world, no difference at all at the time of death. You can't take it with you. So have to leave it all behind. But if we're grasping at it in the last moments of our life, we're holding on to our friends, our family, our wealth, our possessions, even our body. Oh, no, I don't want to go. Okay, just grasping so strongly. How much mental distress do we feel? Okay, so you've got the problem. We're going to die. Okay, but it's like we can die with a calm and peaceful, happy mind, or we can die with a really stressed out, you know, unhappy, grasping mind. The choice is ours. Okay, so once again, if we change our mind, we change our experience of what are difficult circumstances for sure. Nobody wants to lose their computer or have their iPhone stolen. It's a terrible situation, but bad things happen, okay? Um, again, if we understand karma, that's a whole other subject perhaps for another time, but it's like nothing happens for no reason at all, right? It's like uh, no such thing as an accident or a, or a, a innocent victim or, a, a, you know, everything happens due to causes and, and, and conditions, you know, because, because of karma and so forth. So again, we can begin to just let go and relax and, okay, we've got a problem, but getting upset about it isn't going to help. As again, I think uh, Shanti Shantideva said, I think it's Shantideva who said this, I can't remember. Faced with a problem, there's only ever two possible outcomes, right? It's like either we can solve a problem, in which case no reason to get upset, okay? Because getting upset doesn't help. And it's like if we can't solve the problem, also no reason to get upset because it's beyond our control like that. And if it's beyond our control, why make a fuss about it? So again, this sense of, you know, just relax, be open, be spacious in one's mind, and um, learn to let go a little bit, okay? Very, very important. And it, I think, I, I, hopefully, one begins to understand the relationship between attachment and anger, okay? Attachment, in the case of the uh, stolen iPhone, for example, okay, if we're going to, you know, think of a little example. Somebody steals our iPhone out of attachment to that object and, the, and so forth. We may get extremely angry about that. Maybe we even uh, pursue the, the person who stole it. Maybe we catch them. Maybe we even beat them up. In extreme circumstances, people get killed for doing things like that. In, in the real world, uh, people will, will be killed for doing something like that. That sort of intense... A negativity, that in, intense uh, reaction coming from anger. But what's behind the anger? The attachment like that. Okay. And when somebody says something that we don't like, that causes us to get upset or angry or irritated, or that causes us to harm them back in some way, isn't that attachment to the self, to one's own sense of identity, one's own sense of uh, self-importance, like that. So whether we're attached to, to uh, an aspect of our egocentricity or whether we're attached to um, an object or a person, okay? If you look closely, there is a very deep relationship, anger, uh, attachment, and anger, like that. So... Buddha taught many effective methods for dealing with attachment. The most effective, of course, is the meditation on impermanence to remind ourselves again and again and again and again, let go. Everything changes. Don't grasp. Don't hold on. You're setting yourself up 
for a problem if you do. And when you do have a problem, who's to blame? Oneself. Okay? We can't look outside of ourselves for the source of our problems. It all comes from inside right now. Of course, if there was time, and we're running out of time, so I won't go into it, but we can also remind ourselves, and perhaps you've had teachings before about you know, uh, uh, is it what we call emptiness or the lack of inherent existence of self and phenomena. So we can also remind ourselves life is just like a dream, you know. It's not as real as we think it is, okay. It's, everything seems so solid and concrete and, you know, real in a sense, but once we start to examine, and of course it's a very deep subject, I'm just sort of mentioning it, but you know, life is a little bit like a dream. Learn to let go. Learn to relax like that. It will make our situation so much more comfortable, so much more easy, and allow for the experience of happiness to arise. When we're practiced enough, when we're skillful enough, happiness under all circumstances you know, less attachment, less anger, more peace in the mind, more openness and spaciousness. And of course, I keep mentioning these things like to be a little bit, to step back, to be a little bit detached, to be more open, more spaciousness. How do we get there? Okay. The only way I know how to get there is through meditation. Okay. And so I, my own feeling is, and I, I'm sure most Buddhists would agree at some point, in order to really have an effective Dharma practice, in order to be able to really deal with the circumstances of life, in order to practice Dharma, identify delusions, apply the antidotes, practice Dharma in daily life, we need a stable meditation practice. Okay, And until we've got that, it's just almost empty words. I mean, the words themselves can be very effective. They can help us up to a point. But to go really deep, to really transform our mind and our situation and our life, meditation is the key. So we sat for just a, a few short minutes at the beginning of this class in silence, but that practice is probably the most important practice in all of the Buddhist teachings, okay? Because if we can't learn to sit calmly and peacefully for reasonably long periods of mind, uh, time and allow the mind to really become calm and peaceful and in that process clear and open and spacious, then it's very difficult to step back from the uh, difficulties of life to um, be non-reactive. Okay, that distance that I talk about, that space that we need to deal with difficult circumstances skillfully, that's an internal space. Okay, that's a space within the mind itself, and only deep meditation allows that space to develop. Okay, otherwise, we're stuck with the endless, <clears throat> excuse me, busyness and uh, distraction and agitation of our day-to-day -day, um, mind. So <clears throat> my voice is beginning to <clears throat> wear out and I've probably been talking for too long anyway, but perhaps I can just conclude by encouraging you to really make an effort to learn to meditate. I, I was going to speak a, a little bit more about meditation, but time, time is up, okay? Um, uh, you know, there are many, many different methods within the Buddhist tradition, but learning to breathe, learn, and, and meditation is universal. It's not just a Buddhist thing, okay? So one doesn't need to learn Buddhist meditation. But do we need to learn to meditate? Definitely. So make some effort. Explore the different teachers, the, the different methods. Find one that works for you. Find one that helps you develop inner peace. Because from that inner peace, great clarity of mind arises. And that gives us the tool to examine our mind and to work with our mind, but also a tremendous sense of um, contentment and ease and like an internal happiness. And uh, again, as one finds in, in the Buddhist teachings, and I'm sure in other, other traditions as well, this idea that uh, the greatest wealth is not something external. It's internal. And the greatest wealth is contentment. 
to be at ease with what we have, to be happy with what we have, to be happy at all times in all circumstances. And it's possible. We can do that. But we need meditation and we need the methods to work with the circumstances of life as I've been uh, attempting to describe this evening. So please meditate and meditate and meditate because in some ways, just one last thing, what I've observed in my own practice over the years, and, I, and I, again, I'm, I'm sure other people would agree with me, um, there's something very organic about spiritual transformation. Okay. Yes, we must study the teachings. We must listen to teachings and read books. And, you know, of course, there's a, you know, we need that. But, um, through meditation, I think once the mind, we establish a practice of meditation where, whereby we are, we have this tranquility and this calmness within us. And it can take a long time. I'm not saying it's something easy. It requires a lot of effort. Okay. A lot of effort, maybe even the most difficult thing in the world to, to really accomplish in a, in a very deep way, but also the most meaningful. But once we get there, really so much of the Buddhist teaching, so much of spiritual practice, it just unfolds quite organically. Uh, even the truths about the, the obviousness about impermanence, for example, the, the reality of life being like a dream, the, the, uh, the ability to practice patience just comes naturally from a calm and peaceful mind like that. So please make some effort. And those of you tuning in in Zoom, please make the effort to do that because that's what transforms your mind and that's what will transform your life. And uh, on that uh, hopefully positive note, I will say thank you very much and, uh, and stop there. So um, thank you for your patience. You've been uh, a very attentive audience. Um, I should allow, in case there are some questions, uh, I will try and answer them. It's not like, oh, ask a question and I know the answer. It's not like that. Sometimes I'm able to answer questions and sometimes not. But if there are any, I will try. And if not, we'll... Uh, hello, am I audible? Uh, so my question was, if you're too happy all the time, isn't that delusional also? Because I get this question a lot of times that uh, is, I mean, aren't you like too happy? I'm often questioned by my peers that I'm just happy without any reason. So is that also a delusion sometimes? Not if it's, if it's not artificially created. Sometimes we create a, an air of artificiality and pretend that we're happy when we're not. That's a, that, that you can sort of think of as being like a delusion in a way, because it's not honest. It's not realistic. It's a, it, it's a pretense. Okay. But if we are genuinely happy for whatever reason, and some people are just by nature, very, very happy people. Some people we have to, make an effort to become happy, but no, what's wrong with being happy all the time? Isn't that the whole point? Again, in Buddhist teaching, certainly we say, what's the purpose of life to be happy like that? And what's the whole, what to say, thrust or point of the Buddhist teachings to give us methods by which we can achieve happiness like that? As happy, we have the potential to be happy all the time. We should be happy all the time. And if you check anyway, that's what we're all doing with our lives. Whatever it is we do with our life, whether we attend a, a teaching or, or, you know, whether we're working or whether we're traveling or on holiday, every single thing we do, it, down to the food we choose to eat, right? Or the people we choose to engage with or the work we like to do or the books we read. Every single thing we do, we do with the thought that it will, and the hope that it will bring us some sort of happiness and satisfaction. That's the underlying sort of motivation of every living being on the planet. We all want happiness. So if by nature or if through mental transformation or some whatever, we found happiness, wow, that's great. 
share that with people. It's not a delusion at all. No, no, it's something to really rejoice in. And um, happy people inspire other people to be happy. So why not, you know? Not a delusion at all. Something to work towards. Yeah. Uh, and just one more question. Yeah. Uh, so when we're angry and when we learn to control ourselves, but what if it just keeps building up within and there should be a way to channelize the anger. I'm sorry, say again. So uh, when there are situations where we get very angry, yes, either with somebody or due to something that's happened in our life, I've tried a lot like this year because there have been a few transform like, like major events in my life because of which I'm trying to like change myself and control my anger. Mm, but mm. more often than not, I feel like I need an outlet for the anger to come out. Oh, and yes, 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 so yes. Working with anger doesn't mean suppressing anger. That can actually be quite psychologically unhealthy. Okay. At the same time, from a Buddhist point of view, we don't want to let that anger out in a way that it hurts other people. So maybe we have to go to our room and scream or something. I don't know. We have to find some skillful method. But in Buddhism, what we would say is, apply some method so the anger doesn't arise in the first place. So we have to go a little bit deeper. And there comes the practice of patience on the one hand, but also I mentioned a little bit before about karma. Okay, We have to understand that whatever difficult situation we're dealing with, in some way, we can't always identify. In fact, we can rarely identify why but we are responsible for that. If not in this life, sometimes in this life, we have to ask, have I done something to upset this person, to cause them to be upset with me? So again, we need to be honest. Do I need to change my behavior? Okay. But often, and this is where it gets really quite frustrating in a way, it's related to actions in a previous life that we can't identify. All we can say in Buddhism is nothing happens for no reason at all. We have to think a little bit about karma. And maybe facing a difficult situation, oh, okay, I have some responsibility for this. And that can just, again, allow us to maybe let go a little bit. Or maybe we can also think, okay, this is an opportunity to practice patience and maybe cultivate compassion for the person who is uh, suffering. So it's like a wonderful teaching opportunity instead of seeing it as a difficulty. Or maybe we can also think, okay, so I'm having this very difficult situation. I'm purifying some negative karma that created in the past. Mm -hmm. No need to experience it in the future. It's actually, it's a great thing. It's a difficult situation, but it's helping me grow in some way. That's the key, I think, to, to find a way to see these problematic situations that give rise to the anger as part of our spiritual growth. But the other thing is, um, don't try to be perfect. Between now and enlightenment, we'll make many mistakes, okay? We'll get, ang we'll get angry many, many times. It's like, but each time, as long as we sort of learn, it's like, Okay, I blew it again. Next time I'll be more careful. It's like, it's a reminder from the universe, if you like, I'm not enlightened yet. I've got more work to do. And I need to deepen my meditation practice like that. That still, we are imperfect beings. We don't necessarily have a very strong meditation practice. What do we do when we get angry? How do we deal with it? This is, we have to be very, very careful. Don't suppress it, okay? We do need to be able to find some skillful way to, to let it out and to let it go. But by understanding in some way the karmic influences that are at work, and by understanding that the person or the, often it is a person, the person who's provoking us, they are an object of compassion. I think this is really key. That and these sort of ideas in themselves allow us to sort of, okay, let the anger go a little bit. If we suppress it, it just 
festers and becomes worse and makes us physically and mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Depression is primarily uh, a product of, of repressed anger directed at oneself. We have to be really careful about that. It can be very, very destructive. Mm -hmm. But anger, you know, sure, it's, it's a potent emotion. We know that. Patience is something we also have to practice with ourselves towards ourselves, as we must also practice compassion towards ourselves as well. And sometimes if we're angry, okay, just go and sit with the anger and whew, allow it to come up. But be very careful not to act on it like that. Allow it to come up and allow it to flow through you. And allow it because, okay, that's healthier than suppressing it. It's not a, not a I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> it's not. It's difficult. Um, yeah, we do the best we can. That's all we can do, the best we can. You know? And as long as we learn from each time we make a mistake or each time we get angry, and don't never, ever, ever think, oh, I got angry, I'm a bad person. Never like that. No, no, no. Fundamentally, we are good people, decent people. That's, human beings are like that. You know? There's so much goodness in us. And uh, always extremely important, I feel, in our practice, this is getting a little bit tangential, but a really important point to make, you know, always rejoice in the good things that we do each day because there's lots of them, you know. Wives and mothers and husbands and children is like our school teachers. You know, so many acts of kindness every day, amazing like that, that we are recipients of, but that we also give to other people. So it's important to be able to acknowledge them and rejoice in that and uh, appreciate, learn to appreciate our goodness as well. So uh, it's not directly addressing your question, but I just think, feel it's a very important point to make. Otherwise we can get lost in our, oh, we're so deluded and there's so much suffering and Buddhism is really heavy like that. We have to sort of look at the other side as well. We have so many wonderful qualities. And there's so much joy in life. Um, we said sort of life is suffering. It is until we change our mind and relate to it in a positive way. And then life is just gorgeous, you know, if we go about it in the right way. Fantastic to be alive. <laughs> have you been able to conquer anger? <clears throat> have you been able to conquer anger, Venerable? <clears throat> Not entirely, yeah. but I don't... Anger is, has never been my main problem, okay? Uh, I would say attachment is more my problem, okay? Attachment too? Desire, desire and attachment. Um, or just attachment generally. Uh, more of a problem than, than anger. I've never been a very angry person. But I do, I, I have to be careful. And I know myself very well now. I get irritable when I'm tired. Okay, so I have to be extremely careful not to let myself get tired. It's, it's that simple, you know. It's a, and if I feel myself getting excessively tired, I just have to put myself in a situation where I can rest or sleep. Because if, I know myself. If, if, if I reach a certain point, I get very, very irritated. And irritation is like a, just a mild form of anger. I very, very rarely get angry. It's not my main delusion. Actually, my main delusion is pride, if I'm completely honest. I a lot of, less so now, but in the past, a lot of problem with pride. I'm aware of that. Um, somebody, I recently I was teaching a course with, with Venerable Techchog here um, uh, in Dharamsala, and somebody asked me this question, when did I last get angry? And actually, it, the last time I got really angry <clears throat> was about 30 years ago. But I stayed angry for 20 years. <laughs> not, not, not suffused, not, not all the time, but the incident that caused that anger, it stayed with me for yes. a very, very long time. Yes. And I was conscious of it for uh, I would say, I'm serious, I'm not just sure. For about 20 years, it took me a long, long time to completely let go of that situation. 
that somebody did something that really, really caused a huge disruption to my life, okay, in a way that was unexpected and unwelcome and, you know, uncalled for and really sort of, it really shook my world. And I got very angry and I stayed angry about it for a long time. I'm not angry about it now, fortunately. But no, so in a way, anger isn't my main problem. Maybe it is, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yes. Hello, sir. So, so as a beginner, what is the procedure that we follow to be a meditator? As what? As a beginner, what are the key procedure to follow to be consistent in meditation? And well, how, from where okay, to start? Like okay. there is a delusion in a starting meditation also. Yeah, to establish a meditation practice, I think we need to be consistent. Yes. I think we need to set aside a period of time each morning when we first wake up. Okay, I mean, you know, bath, cup of tea, something like that. Then find a quiet place or create a quiet place and sit for 10 minutes in silence, just watching one's breath, relaxing, setting a good motivation for one's activities during the day, but not getting too caught up in, you know, words or just learn to be still. And if that means going to a temple or an ashram or a, a park or some quiet space within one's house, okay, you find a quiet space that allows the mind to be peaceful. Early morning, before the busyness of the day starts, ideally before other people in the house get up, okay, uh, and sit for 10 minutes. Then take a little break. And if it feels comfortable, sit for another 10 minutes. Or it can be five minutes and then short break and then five minutes, like, but not too long, okay? Maybe one or two short sessions each morning. And then build on that slowly, 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 okay? <clears throat> we need consistency. If we come to the to sheet once a week and sit for 10 or 15 minutes. It's not really, it's nice for the 10 or 15 minutes that we're here, but we need to do a little bit every day and work on that. And of course, <clears throat> you know, if we're involved heavily in the world, and most of us are to some extent, it's, it's quite difficult because once you start, you know, you've got school or work or, you know, you've got to go and drive through the traffic or catch uh, the metro or, you know, the busyness of life uh, catches up with us more or less the moment other people in the house wake up yes. or the moment we turn on our computer, yeah. actually, and switch on our phone. So leave them off at least for the first half hour before, you know, uh, that you wake up. Just find a quiet space. Sit. Be still and learn to appreciate silence and build on that. If possible, go away and do more intensive retreats for a weekend, a week, or even longer when time and circumstances allow. But um, <clears throat> consistency, short sessions in the beginning. Don't try and do too much, but a little bit each day. You might be surprised how it works. Yeah. More than that, it's difficult to say. Of course, you then also have to find an appropriate technique for you. I find the simple breathing practice, pranayama. I'm sure you're all familiar with pranayama. Yes, yes. That, that's where we start, whether Buddhist or any other tradition. Basic pranayama. And use that as the foundation of one's meditation practice. Sure. Thank you. Okay. okay. Can I ask a question? Uh, I'm online. Can I? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Hello. Okay. You know, I've often wondered. You know, after seeing, I'm very addicted to TV, to uh, YouTube, and you uh -huh. see all these horrible things happening. You know, yeah, like what's happening in Gaza. <laughs> yes. I cannot get rid of an image of uh, a head, a head in a bundle rolling around. 
a baby without arms and legs, but still trying to roll around. I yeah. simply cannot get that out of my head. And I wonder as a Buddhist, there are things that have happened in Delhi, you know, police have attacked uh, university students or say Muslims, minorities, you know, or in my state, um, tribal people who are protesting something, protesters basically. And what would I do as a Buddhist? Because I get very angry just looking, reading about it in the papers or seeing it on TV. Then what would I do as a Buddhist if I was physically there? And I really wonder, I don't know, but I don't think I could say, oh, it's their karma that they're getting uh, oppressed like this. I, I what do think, you think? <laughs> um, do, do people hear the question? Uh, okay. I said, oh, is yeah. it, I was not audible. No, 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 no. I'm thinking about the answer. You were very audible, Joya. Yeah, very audible. Um, <clears throat> you know, as Buddhists, I think we should always try to help when we can, when it's appropriate, if we're able to help. That's, that's the first part of the answer. But we also have to be realistic. Very often, the circumstances are beyond our control and we aren't able to help. It's just not possible. And in those circumstances, in those situations, all we can really do is generate compassion towards the people who are being <laughs> harmed or brutalized or, uh, you know, hurt in some way. And even though you think you can't, you actually have to think in terms of karma. As a Buddhist, there's really no other way to deal with the suffering of the world. We have to understand it's due to karma that, you know, babies are being killed or people are being oppressed or, uh, you know, bad things are happening. But that shouldn't stop us from generating compassion for all of those involved, okay? And remember, you know, in a situation where somebody is being harmed uh, by another person, for example, or other people, uh, there's more than one victim here, okay? There's the victim who is being directly harmed, no question about that. But the person who is doing the harm they're also a victim of their own anger, of their own delusion, of their own karma. And because of karma, they will experience suffering in the future as well. So however difficult it may be, um, unfortunately, that is the Buddhist answer, to, to reflect always on karma, not to, try, not to react emotionally to it. Because once we get angry or upset and emotional about it, we lose our clarity and we lose our any possibility of helping in a skillful way. And whatever we do may, in fact, make the situation more inflammatory or worse. So sometimes, as a Buddhist, the best we can do is step back and think it's karma, but never lose our compassion for the people involved and for the suffering that is being experienced. Unfortunately, that's the best we can do sometimes. It's uh, it, from the worldly point of view, it's not a very uh, agreeable answer because we want to think, we think that we must be able to help or we should be able to help. We must do something. Well, if we can, we must, but some, we need the wisdom to, acknowledge and accept that sometimes we just can't okay but uh you just have to let it go what else can we do we can't solve the problems of the world and and having compassion doesn't mean solving the problems of the world it means acting skillfully and with kindness and love and compassion wherever and whenever we can but recognizing that often we can't. So just let it go. 
Perhaps not the answer you were looking for, but the only one I can give. <laughs> okay, it's getting late, and so perhaps that's an appropriate time to uh, say thank you. And uh, I hope there was some small benefit from uh, the, the time we've spent together. And I'm talking to the computer, but I should be talking to the audience here. And uh, thank you very much for making the effort to come and uh, giving me the opportunity to teach, teach here at Toshiba. So maybe we meet again one day, I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Davidla, for accepting our invitation to come okay, here. Sure, and sure. It's sure. really amazing. Actually, I didn't introduce you at the beginning, um, but David actually worked here in the early 90s, right? Yeah, so I have a long history with Toshida, as it turns out. Uh, I uh, stayed here for quite a few months at different times, helping with the program. Uh, uh, not, not here, actually, but in some of the previous incarnations of Toshida. We used to have a center over in Defense Colony, and I was very involved in those days as well. So. Uh, administratively and uh, with the spiritual program. Thank you so, so yeah, much. Yeah, no, thank you as and well. Nico. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you everybody for joining online. Yes, thank you everybody and, uh, for joining online. I hope all of us will, as a takeaway, meditate, <laughs> including yes. myself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, hope so too. I hope so too. And uh, I'm really amazed how much um, profound wisdom you shared in such a short time. And I really hope we can learn more from you here at Tushita. And <laughs> I, I don't hope, know about that. I hope every <laughs> time you come to Delhi, uh, we'll <laughs> be fortunate enough to hear yeah, more from a, you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to do. It's a great joy to do. Maybe I can come again sometime. I'll Thank you so much. Sure. And very nice to see you again, Joya, after so many years. It's a very long time. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, Have a good night, well. everyone. Okay. Okay, so we'll finish there. Thank you so much.